maker. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes from the Father except through me. This is 2017, folks. Do you actually expect me to believe that there's only one way to get to heaven? Do you expect me to believe, do you expect this world to believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? See, because it's not natural to be so strong and so strict to say, there, there, there's got to be more ways than one to get to heaven. But we have to understand what Jesus did in order to give us a way to get to heaven. When John chapter 14 verse 6 says, I am the way. And they say, I mean, I'm one of the ways. He says, I am the truth and the word of God will give us that truth. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Not just life, but life more abundantly. And no one's going to go to the Father except through who? Jesus. No one's going home. No one's going to get to heaven unless they first go through Jesus. Now, I may be narrow-minded. I may be very Christian to think that, you know, there's only one way to heaven. But there is only one way to get to God. And that is through the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross for your sins and mine. That is the way. Not a way, but the way. And when our sermon series today is on he's the way maker, he's the ability to get us from where we are to where he wants us to go. I would love it if, especially with some of you, that when you gave your life to Jesus, you vanished and went to heaven. Okay? <laughs> You just gave your heart, and right down here, you gave your life to Jesus, and poof, you're gone, you're in heaven. My life would be a whole lot easier. But I wouldn't be here either, hopefully. But um, A way maker is not necessarily our destination when we go to heaven. The way maker is our life between salvation and through heaven. How do we live these years on this earth? Many of us can give our hearts and our lives to Jesus. And we do and we have. And we know that an eternal destination is heaven. But what about the years that we live here? The junk that we go through. The trials that we go through. The tragedies that we go through. Does he make us a way down here? Because I believe so many times we goof up down here and we feel like that our tragedies and our life is so full of junk that Jesus doesn't love us and Jesus hasn't forgiven us because our life is so full of stuff and we've made so many mistakes in our life that we sometimes believe the lie that our stuff is so important that Christ cannot make a way through our stuff. But he's the way maker. The way maker to home. Have you ever been on a trip? Have you ever been on a journey where you just can't wait to get home? Uh, I was in Cuba just a few years ago. And uh, there's a bunch of pastors there. And, and they wanted to honor all of us pastors. So they put a pit and they cooked a live, or no, he wasn't live when they cooked it, but a pig. And uh, we ate that pig and they didn't have any running water in the village and and they didn't really clean their hands and we ate this pig and and they all told us said you've got to eat it no matter what they have sacrificed a week's wages each to buy this pig for you five pastors so don't insult them eat the pig so if you know me very well you know <laughs> I mean I eat I eat pizza with a fork and knife okay so my hands never touch food hopefully but I ate this pig with my hands four hours later you got it 
four hours later, I was dying. And it was the night before I had to fly back. And it was disgusting. It was terrible. It was hideous how I felt. And you know, when that plane landed from Santiago, Cuba to uh, 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 Miami, Florida, I forgot where we flew into, Miami, Florida, when I landed, I thought, oh, praise Jesus, I am home. I am home. I finally got home. There's times in our life where what we're going through, the vacation that we're on, it may be fun for a while, but destination of home is wonderful. And C.S. Lewis wrote something that I believe is wonderful. He says this, If I find myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. I was made for another world. What, what does that mean? That means when Jesus was the way maker and you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you were created for another world. You were created for heaven. We are strangers in this world. If we're strangers, sometimes we have to act strange, right? Sometimes we are not typical because we act different than the world because we are different from the world and our destination is different than the world. Our destination is heaven. So if we're strangers in this world, he has made us a way through this world to have heaven. Now, sometimes that we, in this world, we live up to somebody else's standard. And I was thinking just today, the worst, most obnoxious, meanest, hideous hypocrite that's in our church. And his name is Spencer Walker. Spencer, will you stand up? <laughs> this guy is the epitome of the worst person you've ever seen in your life. Now... He is the standard. He is the standard. So as long as I am not as bad as Spencer, which I hope, I hope I can live up to that, then I'm okay. See, sometimes we put our righteousness as, as long as I'm not as bad as Spencer, I'll be okay. You may be seated. <laughs> you are forgiven of your sins, my son. But Spencer is not the standard in which we live our life by, is he? And so often we look at somebody that's worse than us and say, I'm better than them. So God, I am good. And we look at our self-righteousness as a way to heaven. And because I am better than Spencer, God, you must truly love me. And we can put other people in our lives, people that as long as we are better than somebody that we know, God is going to love me more than that guy. But God does not use people as a standard. The Bible says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. How weak would it be, really weak, if it says, Spencer is the way, Spencer is the truth, <laughs> That's a stretch right there. <laughs> Spencer is the life. You can't go to heaven unless you live to the standard that Spencer lives to. We could all, every one of us, live up to his standard. But there's none of us that can live up to Christ's standard. And that is why Jesus died on the cross to make us a way through this world to get to heaven. Because it's not about our righteousness. Our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. God looks at us and he says, oh dude, what are you doing? But God doesn't look at us as a believer. He looks at his son Jesus. And because of what Jesus did for us, he can say because of your faith in Jesus, you're righteous. He imputes his righteousness upon us. Not that we deserve it, but because what we believe in our faith in Christ, we gain it. See, every world religion today could take what God gave to us in the Ten Commandments. You look at Islam today. You look at Judaism. 
Those world religions say this. I have to earn God's respect. If I do something, God will respect me. And even though it may be distorted in what they believe, if they're sincere in what they believe, they believe God will honor them and to give them heaven. The difference between their world religion and ours is we know the Ten Commandments is not something that we can live up to. It's not something that we have to have God to love us by. Because if you take the Ten Commandments, little poll here, has anybody broken the Ten Commandments? Has anybody ever lived up to the Ten Commandments? You can say, well, there's certain things. Yeah, okay, there's certain things that maybe you have. Maybe you haven't murdered. Maybe you haven't stolen. But have you coveted? The Bible says if you look upon a woman and lust after you've committed adultery with her, and we could use that for men or women. So the Ten Commandments is something that we look at and we say we can't live up to that. And Jesus is saying that's why I died for you. Because I know that you can't live up to my standard. So what I have to do is I have to take my standard and I'm never going to fall for my standard and I'm going to accept you and I'm going to impute my righteousness upon you. And when we do that, John chapter 14 verses 1 through 6 come into play. I love what Thomas said. He said, he said, he said I don't know where you're going. How, how do we know? You got to remember, the John, John chapter 14, 15, and 16 is the last 24 to 48 hours of Jesus' life. He has spent the last three and a half years with his disciples. And this was the last evening that he was going to have with them. And he wanted to sit down and talk to him. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And Thomas says, I don't know where you're going. How do we know how to get there? And Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And Thomas says, I don't understand it. Every time Thomas speaks sometimes, it's like he doubts God. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus very calmly says, these four things that I want to give to you today. He says, Jesus says, I am the way. The difference between your home and my home. The difference between your church and my church. The difference between the way that you live and the way that other people live has to be, everything has to be consuming upon Jesus. When they come into your home and when they speak to you, do they see Jesus? I watched the interviews as you have this week about um, Sutherland, Texas. And watching the pastor speak, I, I, I couldn't comprehend I couldn't even think about what he's going through. What that church is going through. And he's going to stand up this week. And have 27 funerals of people within his church. Including a pregnant woman. And the baby. And I loved what he said. He said through this tragedy. God is going to be glorified. The talking heads of some of the major networks will say this. Does prayer really work? Where was God in the church? Why didn't God protect you? And sometimes we listen to the talking heads. We start doubting the protection and the love and the forgiveness of God. And sometimes we run away from God instead of running to God In the midst of the tragedies. And the pastor said this. In the funeral service. He said God. Will be glorified. Knowing exactly what took place. Was very saddened. And there's evil. In this world. And we can look. And we can politicize it all we want. But the bottom line is. God is in control. Of everything. Every situation. Do we comprehend that? My ways are not your ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. We cannot comprehend it. We can get upset over it. But we have to have now that the final destination, the way of heaven is through this world. And this world 
hate God and this world hates you because you are his feet, his body, and his voice. But Jesus is the way. He says, I go and prepare a place for you. I go prepare a way for you. And I believe that's talking about heaven. But this is before the cross. And this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. I'm going to die. And they said, how do we know the way? And he said, I am the way. And in 24 to 48 hours, he was nailed to a cross. And he bled and shed his, sin, his, son, his blood for your sins. The way to get home is through Jesus. That's the only way that you can get home. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Believe in God, believe in me. See, our offerings, our love, and our Christ-honoring life isn't good enough. We can do many things. We can try many ways. But the only way that you and I can get to God is through the way of Jesus Christ. We have prayed for people. We've talked to people. We've seen people that think that they could do it on their own. But clearly they cannot. So the first point that Jesus told his disciples, I am the way. And then he said, I am the truth. Jesus is the way to God because he is the truth of God. He embodies the supreme revelation of God. If you've seen me, you've seen God. We have to look at the word of God, the truth of God, to see what the word of God says about Jesus. And because we can see what Jesus is, we can see the attributes of God. You can see what Jesus did. Let me give you a few. The woman at the well. A woman that was ridiculed by all because of her lifestyle. Jesus embraced. And Jesus loved. You look at the woman caught in adultery. Where they were about ready to stone her. Put her in prison. Jesus kneeled down and loved her. Talked about one of his best friends. His name was Lazarus. Died. And Jesus came and he healed Talk about the storms on the sea that was raging. And the disciples thought they were going to die. And Jesus said, shh, peace, be still. And the storm stopped. See, the truth is that we have to see what Jesus did to understand the attributes of God. And once we understand the attributes of God, he'll respond to say, you can't do anything wrong because I love you. And when you do something that is against my word, if you are contrite about it, I will forgive you. I will work with you. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. We can't say because we're Christians that I can't do anything wrong. God forbid that we live in sin because we have our faith. Because the, the life that he wants to give to us is a life more abundantly. And when the word of God says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The word of God tells us the, what the life is all about. And Jesus wants to captivate our hearts. He wants to take us and love us and help us. But I am the life? What does that mean? That means we can take what Jesus Christ has done in other people's lives... And we can adopt it within our own life. The baggage that we carry. The stuff as we watched in that video. We all have stuff, don't we? We all have stuff that we tried to hide. We, as believers, we have to come to church. And we try to hide the stuff. And the anxieties of that self-righteousness... Instead of being vulnerable and open and having a group of people that we can be honest with, we hide our stuff. We put it in our case and we walk around like everything is wonderful. And I truly believe that there's only one way that we can have true freedom. And that's if we give our stuff first to God. And he can make a way of forgiveness because of that stuff. 
But I truly believe sometimes we're so afraid of our stuff that we don't even talk to God about our stuff. We're afraid of what he would think or what he would say, so we hide our stuff. And when we hide our stuff, God cannot forgive us. In Psalms chapter 19, verses 9 through 11, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, more to be desired than they have gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by their servants is warned, and keep them in a great reward. The Lord is clean, and he endures forever. We could give to him anything that we have, and he can love us, and he forgive us in any aspect. He says, I am the life. I am the life. And then he says this at the end. The end of the discourse to his disciples. No one gets to the Father except through me. No one gets home except through me. We've all been places that we just can't wait to get home. We've all been in scenarios that we just hope we get to go home. We've all been in places where when we got home... It made us feel secure. Although we may have enjoyed where we were on a vacation, on a trip, there's something satisfying about going home. And when I stand before people that have lived their life for Christ and they understand that Jesus is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life, and they're about ready to close their eyes and take their last breath. Their journey is going home. That's sweet. Compared to others that have no hope. Compared to others that do not know what's going to take place when they take their last breath. For the child of God that understands that Jesus is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And the only way to get home is through Jesus. The illustration that I want to finish with is so simple. It's a simple illustration of Luke chapter 15. And we know the story is the prodigal son. So the prodigal son went to his father. And he said, I just want you to die. I want your money. And the prodigal son went to his dad. And his dad, with reservation, said, okay. I will give to you what is coming to you. And, and he divided up to his sons their inheritance. One of the sons stayed with his father. And the other son went into a different country. And spent all that he had in righteous living. And one day he found that all of his money was gone. He didn't know what to do. Every friend left him because he was not the life of the party anymore. He had no money. He couldn't pay for rent. He didn't have any money for food. So he signed on with a farmer to feed pigs. And he was so hungry that he got into eating the food of that which the pigs would eat. And he cleaned the pig's mess. And he ate the pig's food. And then one day, as he was working... He said, man, my father's servants have it better than me. And he got up and he head to home. And I want to believe this picture is not true that we see in our pictures that this young man, clean, looking good, came to his father. I believe this dude was filthy. I believe this dude was full of pig food, pig stuff all over him. And the father saw him coming. And I believe the boy in his mind rehearsed this story time over time over time. If you've ever been in trouble with your parents... Coming home late, you, re you rehearse the story. Uh, I got caught going to McDonald's. and No, you weren't. You were still at the party, but you were running late. and you, you, you rehearse the lie, and you expect your mom and dad to believe the lie, but it doesn't work. 
They may act like it does, but they know the truth. I remember one time, I was lying to my dad. It was before we had cell phones, and he goes, where you been? I said, I was over at John's house. He goes, really? Okay, come here. He called John's mom. Ah, I got busted. My dad busted me. You talk about child abuse. That was child abuse back in those days. <laughs> he busted me because I rehearsed this story, and I thought, oh, my dad will bite this, and he'll believe anything I said. He didn't believe one thing I said. He busted me, literally busted me. But I believe this young man rehearsed his story to his dad. But his dad saw him coming. The analogy is you lived in your pig crap for many years, your stuff. And you came to yourself and you said, I don't want to live here anymore. And you need to come back to the Father. You can rehearse all the stories you want. You can make all the excuses you want. You can lie to God all you want. You can blame everybody else all you want. But the same thing that the Father did to the Son is the same thing that Jesus wants to do to you. He saw his son coming up the steps. His dad could care less how dirty he was. He could care less how he smelt. His father saw him and he ran. And the Bible says he kissed him. In the middle of his filth. He didn't expect the son to go take a bath before he em embraced him. He embraced him in his filth. And he said, servant, give me a ring. And he placed this ring on his son's finger and he says, everything that I have is yours. And I'm sure the son thought, I've already wasted half of what you had. And the father says, I don't care about where you've been. I care about where you are. And he said, put a robe around him, covering him that... I want you to be called my son and I want the robe of protection to be upon you. When you walk into my house, you are my son. And he said, kill the fatted calf because we're going to have a party. Because once you were lost and now you came home. We're going to play some music and we're going to have a party. Because when one person repents of their sin, the Bible says heavens are rejoicing when one soul repents from his sin. Now, the party was loud, kind of like sometimes our music, but the party is loud. And the elder brother was in the, par was in the field working, and he heard the music, and he told one of his servants, what's going on? He goes, haven't you heard your brother that once was lost came home, and your dad is celebrating because his son has come home. The older brother sometimes didn't enjoy that. Because he was the main man at the time. But the son that was in his stuff made his way home. That story, if we apply that properly, is about you. And it's about me. We get co so caught up in the stuff in our life that we're living. Sometimes we're too embarrassed to come back to God. Make our way back to our family. And sometimes we think that we've done too much and we've sinned too great. And even God would not forgive us. So we rehearse the story in our head hoping that God would believe our lies. And you know what? God doesn't even hear our lies. God loves us. He loves us so much that in the midst of your stuff, in the midst of your sin, when you come to Him, He's going to do the same thing the Father did. In the midst of your filth and your stench of sin, He's going to embrace you. He's going to give His air to you. He's going to give his fortune to you. He's going to give his forgiveness to you. Then you can clean up. See, our culture today thinks that once I get clean, once I get done with being my addictions, once I do everything right, then I'll come to Christ. Jesus is saying, time out, dude. That's self-righteousness. 
And your self-righteousness is filthy. You can't honor me because you're getting better. Spencer, that's the standard? Okay, great. We're all wonderful. But somebody's standard is not God's standard. God's standard is much better than that. And here's the key. You don't have to live up to his standard. You have to just embrace what he has done for you. And he imputes his standard, his righteousness upon us. So when you're caught in the middle of your stuff and your people around you are fearful and you have an influence over others, what we have to do is we have to understand he is the way maker. If you're struggling with family, with your finances, self-righteousness means I don't need God. But Jesus says I can make a way through this, I can give you biblical principles and I can give you forgiveness. All you have to do is accept. John chapter 14 verse 6, I believe is the most powerful verse in the Bible. It tells every other person who you are. Do you know what it says? I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. That next part is a hard one though. This is 2017. It can't be right. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. Not only to heaven, but through your life. The struggles that you have, the stuff that you're carrying... You can't do it on your own. It's too much stress. Too many fears. The anxieties are overwhelming. And the only thing that you can do is I need Christ to forgive me. I need Christ to show me the way. To give me the truth. To show me the life. I know one day I'm going to die. And I know one day I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus has done for me. And that's great. But what we all have in common is tomorrow. We have all of our stuff. We all put our facades on. And Christ says, get rid of the facade. Get to me. Let me help you. Quit playing the self-righteous game that you can do things on your own because you cannot. I was thinking Sunday afternoon last week. How that church's life has forever changed. How those 27 individuals that came to church to worship God entered the presence of the ultimate worship service that morning. And they're going to be okay because they're in heaven. Do you know who's hurting? The pastor that lost his 14 year old daughter. The family members that lost eight in one family. The 27 individuals that lost their life. But their families. Extended families. Their church family. The Bible says life is like a vapor. It's here today. And can be gone. I believe there's not a better opportunity for us to understand that Christ wants to save us today. Christ wants to heal us today. Christ wants to take our stuff and give us a way through our life so we can have tomorrow. But we have no idea what tomorrow has in store. We have 35, 36 security guards around us at all times. And let's give them a round of applause for what they have done. But if somebody wanted to come in here you know, Spencer's the dirty, rotten scoundrel. I can only pick on you now. You're already mad at me. You can't get any more mad at me. But say that Spencer was that dirty, rotten scoundrel that he is. If he wanted to do something in here, he could do whatever he wanted to do in here. Now, he's going to die. Believe me. There's probably 50 people packing right now. He's going to die. But he could cause damage. Because evil 
can always find its way to cause damage. You take 9-11. You take issues that we can't comprehend. Evil is here. And when evil entered into this world, that's why Jesus had to die on the cross to trump evil. And evil will never ultimately win. Jesus will always trump evil. But in the midst of the tragedies, what we have to do is we have to not be fearful of evil. We have to hold on to God. Some people will say, how could you ever go to church again after you've seen that in Texas? Well, that's when we as the body of Christ need to come alongside each other and say, I need God. God is my protector. God will take care of us. There will be evil in this world, but just because there's evil in this world, you cannot handcuff me to a life of bondage because of fear. I have Christ. And one thing I know, and I, I, I don't want this to happen. You may, do, you may want it to happen, but I don't want it to happen. There may be somebody that comes through these doors one day. And they may shoot me. And they may shoot some of you. It still doesn't change the fact that God's in control. And if I die, I want you to know that I've already made the way through Jesus Christ. That when I close my eyes in this earth, I'm open my eyes in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And the only hope that you have is not to fear evil. Is to understand that my faith is going to be successful. Whether it's on this earth or whether it's in heaven. The ultimate goal is that Jesus made a way through this sin-filled evil world. And I know my ultimate destination is heaven. Let's live a life pleasing to him. Let's understand the truth of the word of God. But let us never forget the way to life is through Jesus. It's not through yourself. It's not through your standards. It's not through you being good. Because we're not good enough. Nobody is good enough. When somebody calls me sometimes and complains about something that I've done or said. And I, sometimes I just like, really? That's all you got? <laughs> that's what, that's, you think I'm just that bad? I'm, I'm ten times worse than what you ever think I am. Because there's nobody righteous. There's nobody should be put on a pedestal. Nobody should be lifted up. We're all sinners that are saved by grace. Let us remember that. Let us remember that Jesus loves each and every one of us. And he wants to take you where you are in your filth. And he wants to wrap his arms around you and love you and forgive you.